Speedrunning stories are often told as tales of triumph, overcoming obstacles of grand proportions. Stories of players versus game, of communities going head to head with each other, and the speed game they love. In Shadow of the Colossus, the obstacles are not metaphor, they are truly monumental. With 16 colossal enemies and a running timer, our subject today is truly a formidable foe. From a fragmented past to a desolate future, our story is as mysterious as this foreign land. Steal yourselves, but fear not. We've seen the light and will guide you down this path. Saddle up, we have a long road ahead of us. Welcome to Speed Docs. In 2005, Sony published Shadow of the Colossus, an adventure game centered around exploring a strange land and slaying the giant creatures who called it their home. But these aren't your everyday big baddies. These colossi are titans, ranging in size and shape from flying sandworms to massive club-wielding behemoths. Each colossus brought a unique and challenging fight to the game for players to navigate and solve. In its essence, the game is incredibly simple. With only a sword, a bow, a trusty horse, and a wheel of stamina, players have to find a way to traverse and overcome these fearsome foes. Almost like a Zelda dungeon come to life, half the fun of the game is figuring out how each boss ticks. Without any side quests or any other enemies in the game, the mission is simple. Take them all down. But that doesn't mean it'll be easy. Each boss fight is like a unique puzzle, one that actively tries to throw the player off, literally. Players not only have to find out how to kill these giants, but also how to hold on when they try to shake you off their backs. Each boss has a number of weak points on their bodies, marked by these glowing sigils. While several bosses only have one sigil, some have as many as three. Within weeks of the game's release, message boards and gaming forums were flooded with chatter about this new game. With an average review score of 91%, it was clear that Sony had put out a winner. But, aside from cryptic story elements and fan theories, there was one more thing that the forums were talking about. The developers at Team Eco had slipped in an additional game mode for players who beat the game, Time Attack. In this mode, players could quickly and easily rematch any of the 16 bosses, but now with an added in-game timer and a time to beat. While it might not seem significant in the modern age, games with built-in timers were not too common, especially outside of the racing genre. Having a timer in the game that saves your fastest time was the genesis of widespread speedrunning in the early days. The earliest speedrun communities were forged around games that had in-game timers, like Mario Kart 64 and GoldenEye 007. Shadow of the Colossus had everything it needed to foster a dedicated speedrun community, and foster one it did. 
It wasn't long before a thread was made on Speed Demos Archive, the premier speedrunning forum and hub in the early 2000s. The members on that forum were all painfully aware of how difficult the game was, especially if they were going to attempt to do runs of it. Swapping strategies and ideas, it didn't take long for the community to discover a revelation. Even though the game had only been out for a few months, the members on SDA were not the first. No, there was a group of runners out there who were leagues ahead. A website was making the rounds on all the forums. A Japanese site with times and videos of top quality speedruns of SOTC. The site was run by a Japanese player by the name of BGR44. Within six months, the community on BGR's site had cracked the code. Pouring dozens of man hours over each fight, the runners there had found the optimal way to fight each and every Colossus. Unfortunately, this site went offline before any major archival efforts could be made to save it. From all accounts, it was a hub for some of the best Shadow of the Colossus speedrunners to share and discuss strategies for each boss fight, as well as share their times. Without access to the knowledge shared here, however, it's impossible to give runners their due credit. While a lot of this information is now lost, there is a silver lining. By the end of 2006, one of the users had uploaded the fastest times for each Colossus to YouTube. In early 2006, the community on SDA found it difficult to beat each Colossus in under the 9 minute time limit. The community on BGR could beat all of them in less than 30 minutes. The difference in quality was night and day. Here's how they did it. 1. Valus The first Colossus is simple enough. By instantly jumping on the back of his leg and stabbing, Valus drops to his knees. During the cutscene, players could blindly run to his lowered head and grab on. With a clear shot at the giant's weak point, Valus is dead in under 30 seconds. 2. Quadratus By instantly shooting the pads of its feet, players had no trouble climbing onto the beast's back. With a weak point at the front and the back, Quadratus goes down in no time. 3. Gaius After drawing out the giant swing attack, runners could climb aboard and hitch a ride right to its shoulder. With a well-timed jump, players could even get some extra hang time from the weapon's momentum to skip climbing as far. After stabbing his head sigil, simply drop down to his middle and finish him off. 4. Phaedra with a helping hand from their trusty steed, Agro, runners could make the jump to the Colossus' hind legs and climb up from there. With an attack to Phaedra's neck, players had access to the single weak spot on the giant's head. 5. Avion After swimming to the middle platform and stirring the beast, players caught a ride on Avion's colossal wings. In a dazzling display, the fastest way around Avion's body was to use the bird's momentum and gravity to do the heavy lifting. After climbing out to the right wing, Avion performs a roll to shake you off. With proper timing, players could drop off the right wing and catch the other on the backswing. With a third and final spot on the tail, a few jumps brought a swift end to the massive bird. 6. Barba the sixth boss would prove to be a tough challenge. To start, runners would grab onto his right hand and hang on tight. After getting into the right position, it's possible to get a launch all the way up to Barba's head. After doing damage there, players could simply drop down to his shoulder and finish off the Colossus. 7. Hydras The Swimming Serpent only has one sigil to attack, but it's not easy to get to. After breaching the surface, the only place to grab a hold of is further down its long back. Moving up between dives, players can make their way to Hydrus' head, balancing jump stab attacks while hanging on underwater. 8. Kuramori Runners were running down to the floor below to get a clear shot of Kuramori's legs. After shooting the front and back legs, the laser shooting lizard falls to the ground below. Dropping down to meet him, runners quickly dispense with the boss in about 40 seconds. 9. Bossaron Agro once again lends a hand by boosting the player up to Bossaron's legs, letting runners climb onto the giant's large back and make their way to the front. This Colossus only has one sigil, but he won't make it easy to kill him. 10. Dirge 
Much like the sandworm's body, there's more to this colossus than meets the eye. Once it's in pursuit, runners could shoot at the monster's eye, then lead the worm to run headfirst into the wall. While it's stunned, climb onto its back and attack the two sigils. However, doing too much damage to one sigil will start the second phase of the fight. By doing two full-powered stabs and one 40% stab on the first weak spot, players could do enough damage to the second sigil to still kill Dirge without starting phase two. 11. Celosia. With a quick jump, runners can climb up to the fire pits and lure the beast over to the pillars. After knocking down the burning stick, runners could do some tricky maneuvering and lure Celosia to the edge of the cliff, then grab the stick and force it off the side. With its armor broken from the fall, the end comes swiftly for this colossus. 12. Pelagia First, jump on the colossus' head as soon as possible. While the controls are crude and clunky, runners could strike the monster's teeth to drive it to the larger islands in the lake. After reaching the pedestal, Pelagia mounts its front legs on the structure, exposing a weak point on its chest. Dealing more than 50% damage will cause Pelagia to dismount, so players deal just under 50% worth of damage before sneaking in two more hits. With some precise damage and a little luck, number 12 falls like all the others. 13. Phalanx By quickly shooting the glowing sacks under its body, players could force Phalanx down to ground level. With some help from aggro, mounting 13's wings is simple. Climbing on its back, runners could simply run along the spine and find all three of the beast's sigils. But much like Dirge, dealing too much damage to any one sigil will start the next phase. 14. Cenobia Because of its armor, Cenobia cannot be attacked head-on. After luring it to the large pillar in the garden, runners use Cenobia's body to get a boost onto the platform. With some quick climbing, they would soon find themselves standing at the top of that pillar, whistling for Cenobia's attention. The pillar falls, but only to reveal another room, this one with yet another pillar and a suspended platform as well. Following the same procedure as before, players could lower the Colossus to bring the house down, literally, breaking Cenobia's armor in the process. With some wild rodeo action, runners only had to deal with one sigil on its back. 15. Argus At the start of the fight, runners would quickly jump onto Argus's left knee. With a carefully timed jump, the giant's knee would propel the player all the way to the shoulder. Next, dropping down to the Colossus's right arm, a quick stab above the elbow makes the giant drop his weapon and expose his last weak point. After slamming its fist to the ground, runners jumped into the palm of its hand and finished it off. 16. Malice the final fight. With careful movement, it's possible to dodge every one of Malice's bolt attacks. Moving from cover to cover, and eventually to the trench, players could reach Malice's feet quickly and unharmed. From here, climb up the beast's skirt until about halfway up. With a carefully placed arrow, runners could make the Colossus recoil in such a way that its hand is resting within jumping distance of the player. Taking advantage of this, runners would jump on and wait for Malice to pull its hand up higher. With its arm raised to its head, players could use the momentum to make the leap to the final boss's shoulder and climb up on top. From here, the one and only sigil laid bare. These were the strategies that were developed by the BGR players. This was impressive enough at the time, but there's more. While optimizations have been found to make these bosses faster, the overall strategies used in each fight haven't changed much, and most are still used to this day. Within a few months of the game's release, these dedicated gamers had discovered the most optimal solutions to each boss fight. While they didn't know it at the time, the BGR team had set the bar very high and would be the measuring stick for years to come. Uh, it's just crazy how well they were able to find those things back then and and just how quickly the Japanese scene w was able to find like the strategies that we still use today, even if they are kind of edited or revised. And um, even though they didn't do full game runs and they only did ILs, they shaped the way that we do boss rush today. 
the users on SDA were dumbfounded. They had no idea it was possible to beat the bosses that quickly. But while you might expect that this was the discovery that kicked runners into gear, it mostly had the opposite effect. With the individual fights covered, the forum users on SDA focused entirely on routing an any percent run. While any percent is a valid and interesting category in its own right, the full game is a lot longer and slower paced than just the boss fights. While the BGR players were playing the core of the game, the SDA users were more interested in horseback riding with aggro. Needless to say, the two groups had different priorities. However, there was one runner on SDA who wanted to bring it all together. In July of 2006, runner Rapu started his journey to learn and run Shadow of the Colossus Any% vowing to bring the BGR strategies into a segmented full game run. As the months passed by, it was clear that this wasn't going to be easy. In the end, it took him roughly six months to finish with the time he was happy with. To his credit, Rapu was able to pretty closely follow the optimal strategies, and considering that he didn't have the luxury of grinding resets as often, it's pretty impressive. In December of that year, Rapu published his 16 segment run with a time of 1 hour, 34 minutes and 30 seconds. The SDA user base was thrilled. One of their own had produced a solid run that implemented the incredible strategies used by the best players in the world while also showing off that sweet horseback riding action they so feverishly desired. With their appetite sated, the SDA forums moved on from Shadow of the Colossus. With the English-speaking community out of the picture, the onus of pushing the game forward once again laid solely on the BGR44 community. The best players in the world continued to grind out strategies to shave off every second they could find. Unfortunately, a lot of runs and information has been lost to time, but here's what we know. From scattered YouTube channels all over the site, we can see that there was an active and competitive IL scene with dozens of players. These runners were practicing ILs, making comparisons between runners, and sharing strategies, all while following the same solution for each boss fight. Some of the important players from this group include BGR44, Kakeru, Kansai Jin, Oki, Miran, Unori, Milk Tea, Hori, 5 Plus 10, Tonu, Unidon, and Shirapan. For several years, these runners were the backbone of Shadow of the Colossus speedrunning. After three years of running the game, some runners were looking for a new challenge. In an effort to keep things fresh, prominent runner Unidon had an idea. Attempting to bridge the gap between full game runs and individual level runs, he created a new category that combined the best of both worlds. This category became known as Boss Rush, or NTA Normal Time Attack. Because the game's main focus is on the boss fights, Boss Rush skips the horseback riding and exploration phases of the normal any percent run, and jumps right into fighting all 16 bosses back to back. Runners have to be proficient in each boss fight and consistent enough to pull it off in a single segment run, without having to worry about the 45 minutes of crossing fields and climbing cliffsides. Unidon began to stream his attempts of this category as far back as 2009 on the Japanese streaming site Nico Nico. For two years, Unidon would run the category off and on, where 2012 would prove to be an exciting year for Shadow of the Colossus. While Unidon had been running the Boss Rush category for a while now, he was about to get a new challenger. One of the best IO runners in the community was inspired by Unidon's work, and wanted to try his own hand at the speedrun. That runner was Shirapan. In 2010, Shirapan held over half of the IO records for both the normal and hard difficulties. Together, Unidon and Shirapan were two of the best runners the community had ever seen. With the two top players both competing in the same category, Boss Rush was gaining momentum in the speedrunning community. But the year wasn't over. In September of 2011, Sony released an updated PS3 version of Shadow of the Colossus. While it mostly provided graphical updates to the five-year-old game, it also brought the classic back to the forefront of PlayStation gaming. Since speedrunning was becoming more popular in the early 2010s, a whole new generation of gamers were trying their hand at the IL speedruns. 
With an influx of new players, the Shadow of the Colossus speedrunning community saw a huge boost in activity. This time, though, the community was made up of players from all over the world. While older runners like Unidon and Shirapon were still around, new players from all around the world were making waves in the speedrunning community. Names like Nokername, Muget, MGO Stun, Kristen Langer, Sunomayo, and Ally Niso. For the next several years, these names would dominate the IL scene. But where was Boss Rush in all of this? Early runs of the Boss Rush category were lost to time, but their influence had spread far and wide. In August of 2011, speedrunner Opario ran Boss Rush at an early Summer Games done quick. While Opario wasn't as proficient at the game as most of the other IL runners, it was clear that the category idea was popular even outside of the original BGR44 community. For the next several years, the Japanese runners were running NTA and streaming on Nico Nico. Unfortunately, because the standard of proof only required streaming the run, most of these runs were not saved or archived for later and are lost to time. We do have a leaderboard from that time, however, you can see that there are over a dozen runners playing in TA. Among them, Shirapon and Unidon are near the top, with what seems to be a time from Unidon while only using one hand. While the Japanese runners were crushing it over on Nico Nico, the runners elsewhere were struggling to catch up. Because the international community had less experience with ILs, the rest of the world had a significantly harder time with the boss rush category. Even still, pockets of runners were determined to learn and run the game. NTA made its way into marathons like GDQ several times over the years, with runners like Negleria showing it off in 2012 and 2013, and Meows in 2015. In all three showcases, the runners were still following the general strategy for each boss fight, but often using slower options for the sake of marathon safety. But even outside of marathon runs, the community was stuck using safer options. Because of the skill gap between the old BGR players and the rest of the world, international runners had a much harder time even pulling off the most optimal strategies, let alone getting them to work in a full NTA run. While these runners were trying to piece together what they could, they weren't ready for what would happen next. 2015 would end up being a monumental year for NTA. While runners had caught glimpses of the Japanese runners from scattered ILs and the occasional Nico stream, they never got to see them in their full glory. Until now. Starting later that year, Shirapon, the de facto god king of Shadow of the Colossus, started streaming to Twitch as well. Bringing his stream to a more accessible platform, the rest of the world finally got to watch the Legend of the East in his natural habitat. While streaming NTA attempts, Shirapon finished a run in 40 minutes and 39 seconds, beating Meow's GDQ run by 10 whole minutes. The community was absolutely shocked. Since he had been incredibly active in the scene for around 8 years at this point, Shirapon knew every optimal strategy that had ever been found, and was deeply familiar with each one. Hell, not only had he probably found some of them, he had used them to grab the fastest IL times for himself. Armed with the knowledge and the skill to crush NTA, Shirapon blew the competition away with ease. Shirapon brought with him a few strats that were never brought to the international community. On Quadratus, he skipped several seconds of climbing by launching himself onto the second Colossus's horn to shortcut right to the head sigil. On Hydrus, he uses a specific setup to manipulate the 7th Colossus to twist its head and come to the surface much faster than normal. This allows him to grab onto the monster's head and attack the sigil in a quarter of the time it normally does. On Boss Aran, Shirapon rushes the beast's front leg and uses physics to launch himself up to the 9th Colossus's head. By skipping straight to the head sigil this way, he saves over 10 seconds from the old strategy. The craziest part of this is, these crazy time saves that Shirapon were using were not new. Videos were later found on YouTube that showed that Shirapon had been setting IL records with these strats as far back as 2007, but because of the scattered nature of this history and the language barrier, these strats didn't get very far outside of a small group of runners. 
On top of these time saves, Shirapan brought with them years of experience. Shirapan knew all of the safe places to grab to avoid getting shaken off. Essentially, certain positions are immune to the boss's shake, allowing players to attack the sigil without interruption. These spots are known as plants. Even with the simple colossi, Shirapan saves considerable time over his competitors with just tight movement, faster plants, and cleaner kills. Compared to Meow's run at GDQ just a month prior, the difference is clear. Shirapan was the real deal, and the rest of the world finally got a taste of godhood. In the year that followed, no one could come close to Shirapan's time. Newcomer Plush SOJ would be the only person to make advancements on their times. A year after Shirapan's 4039, Plush was within four minutes of his time. But before anyone else had a chance to catch up, Shirapan did it again. The old school legend had been practicing his NTA runs and was ready to take it up a notch. In November of 2016, he started up this run. With a rocky start, Shirapan has a rough go at the first three colossi, ending up almost 35 seconds behind after Gaius. It's time to rein it in. Shirapan pulls out an insane IL strat for Avion. Getting a launch from the bird's shoulder, Shirapan does a trust fall jump stab to clear the right side sigil with flare. With nothing to lose, he pulls out all the stops. Shirapan gets clean fights on most of the colossi, only losing time to Barba trying to shake him off and Kuramori landing on top of him. But with the expertise you'd expect from the best in the world, Shirapan handles it all with ease. On the 12th Colossus, Pelagia, he even manages to pull off the extremely hard one cycle, putting him ahead by another minute and 20 seconds. On the warpath, he enters the next boss almost two and a half minutes ahead of his previous run. The Phalanx fight starts off fine, but as soon as Shirapan climbs aboard, there's a problem. While trying to take an optimal line down the beast's back, he slips off the side and hangs on for dear life. Because of the boss's movement, Shirapan can't climb back up easily and struggles to regain his footing, all while the clock is ticking. He's able to recover, but the damage is done. In a similar fashion, the next fight goes just as poorly. While the start of Zenobia's battle goes according to plan, the ending falls apart. After breaking the boss's armor, all Shirapan has to do is climb on and take out the one sigil. Zenobia isn't having it though. Like the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, Shirapan saddles up and Zenobia bucks him off. Missing the plant, Shirapan can't stay on the boss's back and loses another 55 seconds trying to wrangle the 14th Colossus. Shirapan is now only 45 seconds ahead of his current PB. But there's still two more fights to go. While far from perfect, the Argus fight goes okay. Malice is his last chance to save time. Today, Malice was in a good mood and played nice with our hero. Without a single hiccup, Shirapan beats the final boss 18 seconds ahead of his PB and is rewarded with a stunning gold split. Shirapan's run ends with a 37-21. This was it, the ultimate culmination of a decade of work. One of the best to ever do it, Shirapan pulled off a run with all of the fastest IL strats in one go. It wasn't perfect, but it was the best that anyone had ever seen. Shirapan cemented himself as the frontrunner of Boss Rush NTA. While others tried to catch up, Shirapan's time stood strong. In the year following, only two runners were able to get close, Plush, and another Japanese runner, Nato Hanto. By the end of 2017, these runners held a 4019 and a 4036, respectively. What's interesting about Nato Hanto's run, however, is that he played on the PS2 version of the game. Even though his run was cleaner than Shirapan's and had fewer mistakes, the noticeably longer load times held back his RTA time. At this point, however, it seemed as though the community had fizzled out. Without any new developments and a small number of new runners, Shirapan's time looked more and more like it would never be beaten. In fact, technically, this is where the record stands today. In 2018, there was a major shift. In February, Sony published yet another version of Shadow of the Colossus, this time a total remake of the classic. Instead of throwing on a fresh coat of paint, 
the game was redone from the ground up for the PlayStation 4. While it stayed true to the original game, there were a few notable differences with the remake's physics and controls, like rolling and swim speed. For these reasons and more, the community on speedrun.com decided it was best to separate the leaderboards entirely. One of the consequences of the split was that anyone still around in the community jumped ship and moved to the newest game. Even though Shirapon's run had some glaring and notable flaws, there was no one left to beat him at his own game. As the community moved on, most of the old guards were left in the dust, never to run the game again. In the 13 years that the game had been out, the community had made astounding progress. With off-the-wall strategies and some intense practice, these runners had grappled with giants and lived to tell the tale. But all generations have to step down eventually and make way for a new group to take over. Intentional or not, the transition was the perfect opportunity for this changing of the guard. While most of the older runners had retired, like Shirapon and Unidon, some newer runners had risen to the upper ranks. In 2017, previously mentioned Plush SOJ and the newcomer Church Neo had made significant strides in the NTA category. Plush even ran NTA at SGDQ 2017. Being competent and skilled players, these two were quick to jump on the new game, bringing their experience with them in the process. While a lot of the inherent skill of NTA was able to carry over to the new PS4 version, there were a few obstacles along the way. Aside from the controls and movement differences mentioned earlier, a few of the colossi were different too, namely Hydrus and Argus. On Hydrus, the runners on the earlier versions had been using certain algae textures in the water to line up the very precise manipulation to make Hydrus breach the surface sooner. In the PS4 version, these algae clumps don't exist, so runners had to come up with their own setups, but had a real hard time getting this trick consistently. On Argus, runners had to learn to fight the Colossi in a different way. In the past, Argus would drop their weapon when stabbed behind the elbow, but on the PS4 version, Argus won't let go until a certain cutscene plays. Runners had to figure out a new way to kill the 15th boss that was about as fast as before. As such, the first runs in the PS4 version were rough around the edges, as it would take time for proper strategies to develop. Without help from most of the old runners, these newbies had to figure it out on their own. Within a couple of days of the game's release, a few runners are already sharing their times. Runners like Fat Mike Tizzle and Fox Die were quick on the draw, but their 127.56 and 4539 respectively were not very optimized. You'll notice that Fox Die's 4539 is significantly faster than Mike's, and probably because Fox Die had previously done runs of NTA back in 2014. While these two had gotten their feet in the door early, it wouldn't be long before the big boys came to take over. After some practice and discovery, Plush came in with a 3829 on March 2nd, 2018. Less than a month after the newest release, the PS4 version had a top time that rivaled the older versions. Since Plush was familiar with the older strategies and rather experienced, he was able to put together a really solid time on the new engine. Like, really solid. This 3829 hit all of the strats that Shirapon did back in 2016, minus the insane Avion. Plush managed to pull off the Manip on Hydrus for the faster kill, and even adopted an IL strat that attacked Argus's hand sigil without needing to get the weapon out of the way. The only things holding this run back were resetting a few times and Pelagia not cooperating. Outside of these mistakes and mishaps, Plush had set the bar for this new PS4 version pretty high. Plush put the game down for a little while after his run. In the meantime, the community was picking up steam as more and more runners were joining the group. A few of these newcomers were pretty good, too, and made significant strides in a short period of time. Only two months after Plush's run, runner Zik3 took the record with a 3816 on May 21st. Not long after, Foxy Cleopatra got a 3811 on June 1st. Things were starting to heat up. The month of June would see a new runner join the fold as well. Runner Grand Spaghetti showed real talent and skill pretty early on as he got most of the boss fights under his control. 
In fact, by the end of June, Spaghetti had a faster time than Church. Taunted by the fact that all these newcomers were beating his time, Church was ready to dive back in. This was going to be a competition. Uh, so yeah, we. when I came back to the game, I saw that there was another player who was actually like blitzing his way up the leaderboard. <laughs> His, his name is Grant Spaghetti, and uh, and I just remember like seeing his times improve and thinking like, man, why am I not like putting in like as much time and effort? Like, it would be so cool to see my name up there. So I just started kind of grinding too and and trying to get more runs in. And so he had gotten a PS4 with an SSD in it, which makes loading times faster, which means uh, a lot of time cut off of of your RTA. So when he got that, I ended up buying one for myself. And then we kind of went through this era of being on equal footing and just hacking away at our own times. And it was it was a lot of fun. I made a really good friend out of it, too. The two would go head to head, encouraging each other to keep practicing and sharpening their skills. Spaghetti got a 4403 on June 29th. Church got a 4037 on July 12th. Spaghetti with a 3933 the next day. Church took off the training weights and pulled off a 3623, a new world record, and the first time anyone had beaten Shirapon's 3712 on PS3. It had taken over a year for the newer runners to catch up to the legend's final time. Church implemented a new strat for the Argus fight that helped him secure the record. Runners had been attacking the hand sigil at the end of the fight, because that's how the older versions had done it, and how Plush had done it. But this method was finicky, and would lose a lot of time if Argus didn't cooperate. The solution? While still risky, runners found a setup to attack the hand sigil first. That way, if it failed, they could quickly reset and try again. And the best part was, it saved a bit of time over the old method, and still allowed runners to launch up to the top. Not to be outdone again, Grand Spaghetti kept up the grind. Seeing that Church still had some time to save on both Avion and Barba, Spaghetti knew that Church's new record wasn't invincible. It wouldn't be easy, but our pasta protagonist still had a shot at the record himself. Using the hand-first strat on Argus as well, he gets a huge gold split for himself, and plays out the final boss cleanly. He'd done it. The rivals had both gotten back to- Wait, what? Before Grand Spaghetti had time to celebrate, Plush let him know that he had actually recorded an offline run the day before. Plush had completed a run in 34.06, over a minute and a half faster than Grand Spaghetti. Plush had been a bit lazy and hadn't gotten around to uploading the run yet. Sorry to disappoint, bud. Exhausted from the grind, and probably burnt out from the disappointment, Spaghetti put the game down for a while. Church, however, wasn't done just yet. After some more practice, Church was back on the grind. Passing up Spaghetti, Church was making a beeline straight for Plush's record. He still had a ways to go, but if nothing else, Church was persistent. Seeing his progress, Plush hopped back on the grind too. While Church was hot on his tail, Plush pushed the time a little further. With smoother gameplay, Plush was able to push his time down another 25 seconds, making it that much harder for his competition. Two weeks later, October 8th, 2018, Church fires up another run. The run starts off smooth. With no major hitches, Church is on pace with his 3449 PB. While Avion would try to stand in his way, Church manages to pull off a textbook fight against the fifth boss, putting himself ahead by 20 seconds. Barba and Hydrus also fall in quick succession. After Boss Aran, Church is now one minute ahead of PB. He loses some time on Dirge and Pelagia, but a gold split on Phalanx puts him right back to one minute ahead. This is it. Church is coming in hot. With the final blow on Malice, the timer reads, uh, 34.32, 50 seconds slower than Plush's time. Church's run was really solid, so much so that it seemed like he was actually playing better and faster than Plush. In fact, after adding up the times on the in-game timer, Church was actually faster than Plush. 
what happened? Plush had been playing on a PS4 Pro, which was an enhanced console released three years after the initial PS4 release. The console sported faster hardware and higher video resolution. After installing a solid state drive as well, Plush's load times were untouchable. Even with an SSD of his own, Church's base level PS4 just couldn't go as fast. The players on the basic console without the SSD were even more hosed. So where do we go from here? The community found that PS4 Pros and SSDs were significantly faster, and that the more expensive options were notably faster across the board. To be honest, the community had known that it was a thing for quite a while, but assumed the difference wasn't very big. After examination, the fastest hardware was saving around 4 minutes over the base level PS4 console. In the interest of fairness, the community held a vote and ultimately decided on switching to in-game time for the standard timing method. Essentially, runners would add up the timers on each fight, including every reset attempt. This ensured that everyone had a fair chance at getting a top-level time, and the only thing that mattered was gameplay. So luckily we were able to find out that yes, the timing is consistent across all of the console versions, and if you have an SSD, so we eventually, in late 2018, made that switch, and that normalized all of the runs across the board, and come to find out that a lot of us were closer to Plush than we thought, because you know, he was blowing our times out of the water, basically, at that point. After an official retime, Plush's 3341 was an 1818 within game time. Church's 3432, an 1814, just a few seconds faster. In the aftermath of the community vote, Church's time was moved into first place. While it always felt like Church was playing from behind, he finally leveled the playing field. From this point forward, all times mentioned will be in IGT. One note before we continue, this change only affected the PS4 version leaderboard. In hindsight, however, Shirapon had been running on a PS3 with an SSD, and his load times were insanely fast. Upon further review, the PS2 runner who got pretty close, Nato Hanto, actually had a faster in-game time than Shirapon. Nato Hanto had a time of 1945, compared to Shirapon's 2056. While the title is still held by Shirapon, Nato Hanto deserves some recognition for his accomplishment. It was around this time that Church got Shadow of the Colossus accepted into HDQ 2019. In the months leading up to the event, Church got back on the grind. On December 3rd, he cemented his lead with a 9 second improvement to his time. Plush also released an updated guide for the PS4 version of the speedrun in preparation for the event. At the event, Church performs pretty well on stage, finishing a run in 37.58. After putting on a show, Church is supercharged when he gets home. He was ready to pour himself into the run. Only a week after the event, he's already grinding for world record again. His gameplay is crisp, and his skills are sharp. Aside from Solosia giving him some trouble, Church plays all the boss fights cleanly. While his last runs were pretty good, he finally comes away with a solid run that he can be happy with. In the end, Church clocks in at 1729, a massive 35 second PB. Aside from Solosia, Church's run was really solid. While it didn't improve any strategies, it pulled them all off really well for an RTA run. Satisfied with a massive improvement to his time, he could finally put the game down for a bit. With Church, Plush, and Spaghetti all taking breaks from the game, a power vacuum was forming. While that's developing, now's a perfect time for a detour. First, not long after this run, Church would change his tag to Gooperman. He's the same guy, just a new name. Second, sometimes new strategies and ideas are discovered, but for one reason or another, are not implemented into the run. Either because the new method is risky, unreliable, or just downright hard, sometimes good ideas need a champion to bring them into the mainstream. At this point in time, there's a few things that have been discovered that we haven't talked about, so let's get caught up. It's time we revisited the seventh boss, Hydrus. Without the algae texture from the previous versions, runners had made their own setups that worked most of the time. 
By swimming one way for a few seconds, then turning a bit and swimming for a few more seconds, runners ended up in the ballpark of the old algae texture. This didn't work every time, but runners didn't have anything else to base it off of. In July of 2018, runner Tic Tac stumbled across an IL time from another runner named Jim 2.0. In it, Jim accidentally performs a really simple and fast setup that ends up working perfectly. Dumbfounded, Tic Tac tried it himself. So basically imagine this, everyone had like a uh, kind of trouble with the Hydra skip making it consistent because obviously there was no like a specific way of doing it anymore as there was in the original game. So everyone was doing it like the hard way and Brand New and I were just trying to like uh, learn the Hydra skip and for me it kind of worked, for Brand New it really didn't at all and it definitely wasn't the most consistent thing. Yeah, and then Brand New just mentioned, oh, you know, I just looked at the other pe uh, people's runs on the hard IL leaderboard and this guy did it like in a fairly simple way when I looked at it more closely myself. And the guy basically started swimming and then stopped. At a certain moment, you could, I tried to like look at the seconds that passed. So it was exactly one to start and then eight seconds to stop with the like IL timer. It's very easy to time. And then it just worked. And the funniest thing was, I think you can still see it if you go to the description. But uh, basically what he wrote down was, I will never get this ever again. It was pure luck. How did I do this? There's something along those lines. And then I tried to replicate it exactly and it worked. And then it worked again. And it just like was the most consistent thing ever. I mentioned it to the other people on the streams and they were like, no way. And when they tried it, oh, this is consistent and this is easier and it is faster. And uh, yeah, so basically that was kind of a pure accident by someone who didn't know what he was doing and suddenly it became a strat that everyone started using. With this simple and fast solution, the 1-8 Hydra's technique became the dominant strategy. By the time Gooperman ran at AGDQ 2019, just about everybody was using it. This strat was quickly adopted, but there were others that needed some help. Back in July of 2018, IL runner Hammerclav was messing around on Cenobia one day when he noticed some odd behavior while jumping into the base of the big pillar. With some finagling, Hammer was launched up the pillar, skipping the previous strat of climbing along the walls of the adjacent structure. The problem was, the timing was pretty tricky and most runners couldn't pull it off consistently. Not wanting to kill their runs on the 14th boss fight, most runners just abandoned the idea of using it entirely. Tic Tac would be the one to lead the charge, however, as he took it upon himself to learn the strategy. And when Brand New and I came into the game, while still fairly new, we felt like the strat that everyone was using, the Kaze jump, just felt uh, way less consistent or like not as comfortable. So because we were new to the game, we had like a different outlook on it, I guess, because we haven't practiced any of it. So when we just tried to jump into a pillar and mash like crazy to hit that frame window, and uh, when we started getting better and better at it, eventually Brand New just got it first try off of it. It was very cool to watch. Then I improved a little bit on that technique and made it even more instant, which is still the strat we use today. And uh, that one saved a lot of time but it had that uh, added problem with consistency. Church was one of the players who didn't like the strat at all because he wasn't as great at it. But like eventually people started picking it up as well. Since he was still pretty new, he wasn't hesitant to learn the faster strategy and soon became somewhat of an expert on the subject. But while this strategy and the Hydrus one were both found in mid-2018, this super jump was not used in runs until much later. In February of 2019, runner Aiden RU found a new strategy for Quadratus. While messing around with the fight, Aiden found it was possible to jump to the tip of Quadratus' tailbone, putting him right below the back sigil. Since it was faster than climbing around the side of the boss to the back, this method saved a few seconds and was very consistent. A nice find, right? Once he shared it, however, IL runner Matarashi took the idea and saved a few more seconds with a faster arrow shot to the foot. It was such an improvement, Matarashi improved the IL world record for himself. 
With this really fast and simple IL strat, Boss Rush runners adopted this new way of beating the second boss, saving around 15 seconds over the method they previously used. Named after Aiden Umferson who found it, this strat would be called the Ump Jump. Last but not least, in April, Tic Tac's IRL friend Kerrigan was playing through the game casually on stream. On Zenobia, he made an offhanded comment. You speedrunners probably use those little platforms to jump from the pillar to the plateau, right? It turns out, in the PS4 version, the developers altered the terrain of the surrounding wall and added in these little ledges near the big pillar. Since runners had been so focused on adapting the old strategies to the new versions, no one had thought to think outside the box. With some inspiration, IL runner Wacky Wolf AO played around with the idea until she found that it was indeed possible to jump from the falling pillar straight to the ledges and then the larger platform for stage 2. Because she did the legwork, the community named this the Wacky Jump, and it saved around 10 seconds. At the time of Gooperman 1729, the Hydra Strat and the Super Jump were the only ones of these tricks known about at the time, and Gooperman intentionally opted to not go for the Super Jump. But now, with all of these time saves, there was room for a major improvement. While Gooperman was still inactive since his world record time, someone else was going to use these new tricks to get ahead. In August of 2019, Foxy made a comeback to the Boss Rush category. While he hadn't exactly been in the world record picture since June of 2018, he had always been near the top of the leaderboard. After bouncing around different categories for a while, it was time to take the top spot for himself. After practicing the new discoveries, Foxy gets a good run going. Foxy doesn't go for the ump jump on Quadratus, but plays the first few bosses really well. In particular, his Phaedra, Pelagia, Zenobia, and Argus fights are really spectacular. On Zenobia in particular, Foxy pulls off the super jump strat and the wacky jump as well, saving 24 seconds over Gooperman's 1729 time. But the most impressive part of the run? Foxy didn't reset once for the entire thing, pulling off every strategy first try. Aside from Boss Iran, where he didn't get the plant, every other boss fight went smoothly. In the last year and a half, no world record time had ever finished without resets. Until now. On August 5th, 2019, Foxy set a new record with a 1649. This run was nuts. Not only did it pull off most of the best RTA strats known at the time, it did them all first try. Foxy had taken down Gooperman's time by 40 seconds, a massive improvement to the record. Aside from the boss Iran, Foxy's time was considered to be almost perfect. The run was so insane, it stood unopposed for over six months. Now, in all fairness, there weren't a lot of top players around to compete with the time. While Aiden and Tic Tac had just beaten Gooperman's time themselves, they were still quite a ways off from taking it from Foxy. But not all hope was lost. In an effort to motivate the community, Gooperman made a reappearance. However, he wasn't back to run the game. No, no. Gooperman was here to make a bet. We were like, hey, you know, like, looking at old runs, like, yeah, my run was clean. You know, um, no resets, those sorts of things with, like, you know, most of the updated strats. But I, I wasn't super fast. I was more consistent than anything. So we really realized that, you know, if we optimized a lot more, and it sub 16 really wasn't a, a crazy thing to think about and so that's where church kind of came along and was like yeah like i'll give anybody a hundred bucks you know if they're able to do it in march of 2020 seven months after foxy got the world record time gooperman put out a bounty runners had been resting on their laurels it wasn't that there weren't innovations that would improve people's times they just weren't trying hard enough to implement better strats into the run everyone knew that the run could still be pushed. Gooperman issued a challenge. The first runner to submit a sub-16 minute time would earn themselves a prize of a hundred smackaroos, a Benjamin Franklin, a hundred big ones. It was a worthy challenge indeed. It didn't take long for this bounty to bring runners out of the woodwork. 
the same week that it was announced, the standing record was already broken. The father of the super jump, the avid and exclusively IL runner Hammerclav, broke tradition and put together a boss rush run. Almost like watching Shirapan back in the day, Hammerclav had the knowledge and skill to pull off some crazy maneuvers. Hammer not only goes for the Gaius IL strat of climbing his arm to get to the head faster, he also pulls off the Avion jump stab technique for the first time in a run since Shirapan in 2016. Some of these boss fights were a sight to behold. As an IL runner though, Hammer wasn't used to no reset runs, and with the punishing nature of the game, small mistakes made for big time losses. In other words, some of his fights were honestly pretty sloppy. But even so, Hammer was still able to take the record over Foxy, with a 1646 on March 14th, 2020. If Gooperman's goal was to kick runners into gear, it was working. Hammer is probably one of the coolest runners i guess or one of like the, the one of the coolest cases because he's an aisle runner and he actually took the time and effort to really take those ils which were pretty inconsistent and get them about as consistent as you can be at them i won't say like there's a huge like you know there's like a high success rate on them but he wasn't scared to do runs with those even though his success rate with them uh was higher than everyone else's, they were still really difficult. Within no time, there were multiple top-level players all competing again for the bounty. Foxy was back in action after a long break, Tic Tac was running again, and a newcomer Inception was making incredible progress. Tic Tac had been playing on and off since 2018, but never made an effort to really take down the top times. Inspired more than ever, he was making his way to the front. But in order to get there first, he'd have to outplay Sean, who had only just started running the game at the beginning of the year. Against all odds, it was anyone's game. Even if it was April Fool's Day, what happened next was no joke. Sean had been making steady improvements, but he had one secret technique that helped him get to the top. Speedrunners hate him. Sean was a major proponent of no reset runs. As the name implies, Sean would simply finish a vast majority of the runs he started, even if they were way behind on time. For him, it was the muscle memory and the practice that he was here for, not the glory. But it paid off in dividends. Yeah, so basically I'm not really a competitive guy. So I, like, yeah, as soon as you start really compare yourself to each other that kind of makes me unco uncomfortable so usually when i do stuff like that i just try to um do it the way i just like uh get the most fun out of it and for speed running it's basically just doing runs and trying to find ways to like get a better time but without making it my first priority so like I, I try to like my first priority is basically just having fun and playing the game. And like in the second time, I try to understand what I can actually do better, basically. By approaching the speed run with the student mentality, Sean was rising through the leaderboard fast. By being so consistent with his gameplay, he was able to put in more attempts, get more experience. So much so, that only two weeks after Hammer got his 1646, Sean was knocking on his door. While Hammer had done ump jump for the first time in a record run, it wasn't clean and lost time. Sean was able to pull it off better and save time over Hammer. Next, Sean created a faster Gaia strat where he drops from the head to the chest. While it wasn't faster than the IL, it was faster than the standard NTA strat. For Phaedra, Sean was implementing a new idea that he had worked into his gameplay. Even though it's generally inconsistent, Sean had found a way to get a launch from Phaedra's leg all the way up to its back, saving several seconds over the old climbing method. Beyond these things, Sean's run was just really clean. Where Hammer had stumbled on several fights, Sean had done so many no-reset runs that he could handle just about anything. In the end, Sean pulled ahead of the crowd with a 1643 on April 1st, 2020. 
I might be world record. Well, yeah, that might be Recky. <laughs> While Sean's run was very impressive, it wasn't perfect. He had some fancy new strats to save him some time, but he wasn't playing on the optimal level yet. So who better than Foxy himself to come in and show him how it's done? Without even using the Ump Jump or the Phaedra launch, Foxy plays the game just like he always does. Fast. Getting the super jump on his first try and saving time over Sean on Phalanx, Foxy brings it home with a 1640 on April 4th. The competition was heating up. Foxy's 1649 had stood for seven months unopposed. In the span of a few weeks, the record had been broken three times by three different people. The community morale was at an all-time high. To say that Gooperman's bounty had an effect on people would be an understatement. It actually worked, like even Hammerclaff, who was a pure DIL runner, ran Boss Rush for the first time. And there was like a specific moment in time where like four or five runners were running actively simultaneously and just beating each other's times. Like within days, there was like one moment where like the world record was beaten like four times or something within a couple days. If I remember correctly, that was absolutely insane. Even if the fastest completed time had been beaten three times now, we still weren't even close to the bounty payout. Runners still had another 40 seconds to go before they hit the mark. Still, now was the time. The top runners were all whipped into a frenzy. The newcomer was playing hot. Sean's consistency meant that more of his attempts were on PB pace. If he could play really well on every attempt, he just had more attempts that were world record pace. It wouldn't take him very long to get back in the driver's seat. The day after Foxy took the lead with the 1640, Sean fired back with the 1620. Sean was relentless. Not satisfied with his impeccable progress, he just kept pushing for more. With cleaner gameplay and fewer resets than his last run, Sean was able to beat out Foxy by 20 seconds. If it wasn't for a few substantial time losses on Zenobia and Argus, Sean very well could have claimed the bounty right then and there but that would have to wait for another day. Sean wasn't the only one with a hot hand that day. Inspired by the fervor of his fellow runners, Tic Tac booted up the game as well. He didn't even decide to stream his attempts. Tic Tac would rather update Sean in his chat during Sean's stream. Tic Tac wasn't the most consistent runner, but he was on the forefront of tricks and strategies. Not afraid to mix things up, he tried to innovate on the run when he saw the opportunity to do so. As such, his run was quite the sight. Tic Tac pulls off the first IL quality ump jump in a full game run, saving every second that the strategy provides. His Zenobia is also one of the best fights pulled off in a full run, since he had been at the forefront of the super and wacky jump. Unfortunately, Tic Tac loses some time on Avion and Hydrus after missing some jump stabs, and suffers a major loss on Phalanx after botching the IL strat but his skill is apparent. With his time going into the final fight, Tic Tac has a shot at the sub-16 bounty. In a moment of panic, Tic Tac misses the arrow shot on Malice. Several times. Any shot at the sub-16 was gone. The pressure was too much to bear. Still, pulling it together on the home stretch, Tic Tac brought it home with a 16-19.9, a new record by only 0.3 seconds. Before Tic Tac even had time to enjoy his record, once again, Sean fired back. Less than 24 hours later, Sean was already back on the grind. With mistakes of his own on Bossaron and Argus, and missing the Phalanx IL strat just like Tic Tac, Sean misses the sub-16 as well. Sean ends his run with a 16-12. By this point, the runs were intense. Five records in one week, by three different runners. Hell, even IL runner Hammerklav had a world record in there. This point in time was insane. It also showed signs of what was to come, as the rising star in Sepshan was a formidable opponent. While others struggled to best his times, Sean seemed like he could smash through the competition with relative ease. Could anyone stop this man? Even with all of this activity, we still haven't collected that bounty yet. 
With all of these new innovations, the record time was cut down over 30 seconds, but the fastest time was still 13 seconds away from the grand prize. Who would be the one to take it to the end zone? Sean. It, it was Sean. What did you expect? He's, he's crazy good. On May 8th, he finally got the big one. Sean's run starts off okay. His early game is kind of weak, with the slower than normal Vallis, Hydrus, and Kuramori. However, after implementing an instant jump stab strat on Basaran, he makes up the time and is back on track. He still misses the failing Sael, and even fails the wacky jump on Zenobia, but he can still make it. In the final moments of the run, Sean pulls out a riskier Malice route to shave off just a little more time. He wasn't going to let another 15 escape his grasp. Sean comes in clutch, finally securing the sub-16 run, this time a 15-51. I don't know, like for me it was kind of um, just running the game and getting PBs, I knew I could get like a better time, not not by like using harder strats or stuff like that, but, but just by like getting um, a really clean run with like no resets and stuff like that, no retries. The way I saw it was basically, I was just trying to get a nice run that I could be proud of. Sean had made huge strides and was far and away the fastest runner in the community. In less than half a year, he had muscled his way to the front of the crowd. Even still, Sean wasn't satisfied. He had managed to get this 15 minute time, but he was still failing so many strats. Not to mention, there were still IL time saves that could be routed in. Sean couldn't leave things like this. In no time, Sean was on the warpath, and the fastest completed time was left in shambles. By the end of May, Sean had a 15-17. It took the community months to get from 17 minutes to 16 minutes, and the same for 16 to 15. In a matter of weeks, Sean was ready to break into the 14-minute time range. He wouldn't need long to get there. One month after his last PB, June 19th, Sean's run starts off nearly perfect. He's nailing every strat and he hasn't reset once. Before too long though, Sean misses the plant on Basaran. Getting thrown off at the worst time, Sean loses almost 20 seconds on this one boss. His only saving grace for a PB? Sean has to finally hit the phalanx strat. It all comes down to this. Instead of shooting the arrows at the start, Sean hops on aggro and races after the Flying Colossus. By shooting the airbags while on the move, he can make it to the 13th boss's wings a bit faster than the normal way. The boss is also scraping along the ground, so Sean makes the leap from aggro directly onto Phalanx's back. This was the 30 second strat that he needed to seal the deal. With nearly perfect splits in the last few bosses, Sean closes the run out with a 14.47 on June 19th. Like the last one, Sean had taken down yet another minute barrier. Upon completion of this run, the community agreed. Like the 16 colossi that laid at his feet, this category was dead. Unless Sean pursued it, Boss Rush NTA wasn't going to be improved for a long time. Lucky for them, Sean can't stay away for too long. With that 20 second time loss on Boss Iran, Sean had a few loose ends to clean up. By the end of the year, he was sitting on a 1438. Almost single handedly, Sean has been leading the charge through the 14 minute range. Sean lowered the time again to a 1416 on February 24th. A year after Gooperman's bounty, Sean is standing at the gates of 13 minutes. At the end of 2020, Sean was the only person with the sub 16 minute time. Tic Tac was the first person to break through that, getting a 1510 in July of 2021. Let's go! Woo! <laughs> Okay, I can improve this, but the end was goddamn sick. I'm very happy with this run, and I can finally focus on other things for now. But I will keep running, and this is amazing. Hell yeah! <laughs> Let's get to IGT, shall we? Many others have tried and failed. 
few can keep up with Sean. So what does the future hold for Shadow of the Colossus speedrunning? Sean has been working on improving each Colossus, but there's still a ways to go before we hit human perfection. In theory, a run using the fastest completed time for each boss would be just under 11 minutes. These times are unrealistic in a boss rush setting, but there's still room for another minute or two of time save. Or maybe a new runner will steal the limelight. Like Sean stole a show back in 2020, maybe a new runner will rise to the challenge. Hell, if any of the top IL runners like Hammerclap took over Boss Rush, they'd have the potential to really stir things up. Only time will tell if any other IL runners will be brave enough to bridge the gap to the other side. Over the course of 15 years, Shadow of the Colossus has seen some incredible displays of skill and determination. Like the Tower and Colossi themselves, runners have overcome obstacles of legendary proportions. While the details of their history are somewhat lost to time, their influence has echoed through the ages. Like the lore of Wonder and Dormin, the mystique of Shiripon, Unidon, and BGR are the stuff of legends. The groundwork they laid out has been the foundation for the Colossus speedrunning community to this day. Because of their work, titans like Plush, Gooperman, Foxy, Tic Tac, Sean have stood on the shoulders of giants and themselves become larger than life. These runners have become the Colossi themselves. The shadows they cast are formidable. If you're up to the task, can you topple them too? Hey, thanks for watching our video. If you want to join the community, check out our Discord. Also, consider supporting us on Patreon. It really helps. Thanks.